Well, good afternoon. This was a fun session when we were practicing out there. Um, so welcome. And it's going to be interesting for those who are wondering. It's a session around um, investing in tech or investing in the early stage ecosystem, the valuations, M&A, and exits outlook for 2023. And like you said, my name is Eva Arigia. I work with the East Africa Venture Capture Association, which is the ecosystem enabler for VC and PE within East Africa. Um, so I won't let them introduce themselves. They'll introduce themselves as they give their first remarks. And um, I'm going to start with a quote from Eminem. Yeah, I'm into a VC summit, so I'm allowed. Um, Eminem, snap back to reality. Oh, there goes gravity, but we won't give up that easily. And um, in the context, that was lose yourself. But um, in this context, it's about the gravity of valuations in the past year. So starting with Babaka from the far end, what has surprised you the most about tech investing in the last six months? Can you hear me? Oh, yep. Yes. Uh, so hi, hi everyone, I'm Babaka Sek. I work with Proparco, which is the French development finance institution. Um, what has surprised me the most in the past six months is that um, despite a macroeconomic environment that has become more challenging with inflation and also decrease in funding, um, there has been some latency in expectations uh, from entrepreneurs uh, in terms of valuations um, and what is considered to be a fair uh, valuation for a company. Um, because in a context where uh, the flows of capital have decreased, um, I mean, in our conversations, I think we, we have mentioned it previously, but what we see is that U US investors mostly have exited the market. So kind of all the tourism capital uh, has left. So now we're, entrepreneurs are left with the true believers in Africa. And we're really dedicated to funding and backing entrepreneurs. But at the same time, I think for the ecosystem to be successful in the long run, we need to have a good balance between risk and return. And right now, the situation in which we are is a bit uncomfortable. I think from the investor perspective, because we're a bit worried that what we're doing or what is expected from us to do might not enable us to build something that's sustainably successful. So that is what has um, surprised me the most in the past six months. Um, I didn't want to hog the mic, so anyone wants to contribute to that? Otherwise, I'll just ask the other person on the far end. Um, you just finished fundraising, Mike. And, um, what would you say stayed with you during your fundraising cycle? And how do you see that impacting your investment into your portfolios? Thank you, Eva. <clears throat> oh, it's great to see a full room of interested people here to gain insights from this wonderful panel. <clears throat> Incredibly full room. Um, so <laughs> thank you for clapping. My name is Mike Mompey. Uh, I'm uh, one of the co-founders uh, and one of the kind of team members who run a firm called Enza Capital. Enza is Zulu, it means to build, to make, and to create. And we back founders and teams using technology to solve large and meaningful problems across Africa. So we're multi-stage, pre-seed through to Series B. Um, <laughs> you, you said that I finished fundraising. So one thing, many of the entrepreneurs and, and investors here know is you never finish fundraising. Um, while you're growing, while you're grinding, while you're building, you don't actually finish. So could you, I just want to get a sense, who here is an entrepreneur? You're building a business? And keep your hand up if you've finished fundraising. Okay, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I thought. You just, it, it just happens. So thank you for the question. Um, however, maybe why don't I pass over to the other colleagues. So we know who's on the panel. I want it to be super dynamic. Smart it was two here. part. So yeah. there was a bit about fundraising, but also what has stayed with you yeah. um, during the last, in your journey to fundraise that you hope to transfer to your entrepreneurs as a lesson? So I think one of the things as fund managers that, that we need to do is we need to raise capital from an, oftentimes people and institutions who don't have the level of proximity to the markets that we're in and that we're operating in. Um, and in order to do that, we need examples of incredible businesses. Uh, we need fantastic stories. We need fantastic founders. And we need to be able to communicate those to the market 
uh, in a way that's not just telling a story, but that's also showing results, growth, traction, um, sustainable businesses with real margins, building in, in real markets. Um, and so I think what has perhaps stuck with me is the importance of the quality of the businesses that everyone's building uh, for us to be able to raise capital and, and invest uh, in those businesses. Great, and you bring up a great point, importance of the quality of the business. And so to the lady on the panel alongside myself, what do you define as a quality business? Um, Telcom is also one of the older VCs in the continent. So what is a quality business in 2023? Uh, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, so I'm a partner at TLCom Capital. We're a VC fund investing um, with a focus on seed and Series A in terms of first check into our company, but also have an ability to follow on. Uh, and now we're deploying out of our $150 million uh, Tide Africa fund. And uh, maybe before I answer your question, I think I want to make a point around, there was a previous comment around what has surprised me in the last few months with what's happening in the, in the ecosystem. And so what's happening is, so there's been a lot of contraction uh, in terms of capital flowing into, into, the, into the continent. My view is valuations have actually gone, gone lower. If you, and I think back to more sanity, I think there's more sanity in the ecosystem because things were a little bit, it felt a little bit like the Wild West. Um, I've been in the ecosystem since 2013, 2014. So it was quite something to, to see what was happening. It was great that capital was coming in, but there were a lot of things that were, were, were wheels were falling off, uh, if, you, if, if, if I can use that phrase. And I think, but what has actually also surprised me over the last few weeks, just talking to entrepreneurs is some entrepreneurs have kind of, so, so now there's this push to profitability, um, you know, cut your burn and all of this stuff, which is all you know, great, uh, I think more from a unit economic standpoint, but what is happening is that many entrepreneurs are becoming more shy in terms of their ambition levels um, because the trade-off between growth and, uh, growth and profitability, I think as long as your business has the right unit economics, so gross margin, contribution margin, positive, you should pursue growth. Uh, if you're, if, of course, if you're building a business that you want to be venture-backed, because if you start just focusing on profitability now, then you might build a nice business, but it's not venture-backable, and you're going to lose the next year, the next two years, so that when you go back to market, the business is not interesting because it hasn't grown. So I think there needs to be a balance between, yes, there is contraction, but we're still investing. Like, I think everybody on this chair is still investing. Um, so entrepreneurs should, uh, should continue to be ambitious and continue uh, to build um, large businesses and not, you know, cower down and listen to everything else that's uh, the, in, the, in, the, in the ecosystem. Perfect. And uh, getting to you, Peter, um, she talked about growth at any scale and entrepreneurs cutting back on their burn. Um, what are some of the strategies that you've seen applied, and you've been around for some time, um, to help businesses get into that cash positive mode? Thank you. Hey, everyone. Oh. Hey everyone, I'm Peter Orth, I'm the co-founder and general partner at 40X Ventures. We're a early stage Africa focused fund. We do pre-seed to series A across the continent and uh, we're generalists, we, we back a range of business models. And in terms of your question, um, you know, and also just touching on this environment, I mean, I think this is very much a dose of reality. I think the thing that was an aberration was the idea that you could build a wildly unprofitable business and then eventually at some undefined point in the future, you could shift to profitability. And I think that a lot of people hold out the example of Amazon doing that as like, oh, well, Amazon did it, we could do it too. But, you know, they forget that, you know, Jeff Bezos is a very quantitative hedge fund guy who had a very explicit plan of how he was going to get there. And I think there were a lot of companies who didn't really have that plan and they just thought, if we get big enough, then eventually it will happen. And oh, next round, the round after that, it had been a very much growth at all costs type of environment. And I think as in investors, broadly speaking, you know, we're all somewhat guilty of 
letting that go on and get sucked up into that, uh, that dynamic. Um, now, I think that the reality is the bar is much, much higher for the you know, unit economic fundamentals of the business. And you need to have a plan to get there. I don't think it is, no one is gonna be interested in your business if it's a very slow growing business. That's just not what venture capital is. The whole premise is building very large businesses that have the potential to be incredibly transformative. But I think what you need to have is one, uh, a business model that actually has a chance of getting there um, in a capital efficient way and not requiring hundreds of millions of dollars to eventually get to profitability because it's most likely the money just will not be there. Um, and at the same time, it's important to have a plan. And I think you know one of the things that we're looking for now is a very explicit, well-researched plan for how are you gonna get to profitability what are those drivers? And at what point is your destiny going to be in your own hands in terms of having a profitable business and not being reliant on venture capital? And those businesses that don't need any money are probably the only ones that are going to be getting money going forward. So are you valuing these businesses? And Mike, you can chip in. Are you valuing these businesses based on their cash positivity going forward? Um, or is it still the growth um, story? Well, there's a lot of different factors that go into valuation. At the end of the day, I think there needs to be an exercise where you're figuring out what can this business be at scale? What are the chances of getting there? And how do I discount that future to today? Um, on one hand, on the other hand, thinking about, okay, I'm being told by, by these founders, this is what they're trying to accomplish over the next year. And this is what I want to raise my next round at. And you have to check that in the market and see like what is happening at seed rounds, what is happening at series A rounds, and do uh, you know weigh different data points to try to triangulate on what a reasonable valuation is to invest at this stage. And I think that you know one exercise that uh, or one thing that has been surprising to me about this environment is that there's a lot of founders who have not fully adapted to this new reality and are still really pushing for higher valuations and not going through the exercise of even if they hit their aggressive targets, the next round is maybe going to be a down round based on the multiples that are current be currently being paid in the market. And there is a big shift where margin is much more important um, GMV multiples are being used less frequently, net revenue multiples are much more frequent, and so it really depends on the round, but once you're at Series A and later, it's, it's much more in that world than not. Putting you on the spot, Mike, you're a champion of down rounds. Um, <laughs> yeah, what's that about? <laughs> uh, so being a champion of down rounds, <clears throat> okay. I, I'm not sure where that title came from, but thank you very much, Eva. Uh, look, I think Peter made some fantastic points around how companies are valued. It depends on the company. It depends on the stage. It depends on the market. Uh, you know, often as uh, multi-stage investors at the earliest stage, you know, we need to approach pricing companies uh, in ways that aren't looking specifically at comps on revenues, for example, if you're a pre-revenue uh, business. Um, but you can look at management ownership. Uh, you can look at comps in, in other markets. You can look at growth potential. Um, the question really is around down rounds. Um, so, you know, as a, as a venture fund manager, uh, what we're expecting to see in the market when prices are too high is that there's going to be a correction. In the public markets, we've seen from the peaks, we've seen a lot of the loss making, high growth businesses come down 70, 75% from their peaks. Um, and if you look at that with the kind of macro in Africa as well, where inflation you know, across the continent was about 9% um, on, on average kind of last year, debt to GDP ratios across some of the core markets are above 75% uh, and climbing. There, there's, there's a lot of macroeconomic risk combined with there was this overwhelming kind of push from founders, local investors, as well as what Babakar referred to as tourist capital that was coming in wasn't really understanding the fundamental challenges or the opportunities of those businesses and placing capital um, at, at very high prices. And now the risk is in that market, and even today, it's probably easier to raise $20 million than it is to sell a business for $20 million. 
And like that is such a perverse reality that we need to accept. If we look at the number of transactions that are kind of 10, 20, 30 million dollars on the continent, then we look at those businesses who are being acquired for that much money, there's a, such a disconnect. And if you play that through to uh, kind of public markets, more global markets, if we're paying too high a price, then the venture model won't work, which means the globe will not believe that the African story is real and that there is potential here. Fund managers won't be able to raise more capital and fantastic entrepreneurs, even if you're not overpriced, uh, even if you are going to build an exceptional business, aren't going to have access to that capital. So uh, that's a, a little bit of a comment there. Okay, so my take is that you're better off raising a smaller round that allows you to go further on um, than attempting to sell, right? Um, and getting to you, Andretta, one of the things I wondered is um, when I spoke to you all earlier, everyone's investing up to Series B. And TLCOM is one of the big things here. Um, what's the impediment to getting bigger ticket sizes um, out from a fund perspective? And especially as we're now getting to look at M&A as a potential growth strategy for the companies, where do we see that um, kind of capital coming from? It's actually a real gap. Because um, I think on the pre-seed seed stage, there are enough players, uh, enough players there, Series A as well. But as you know, as companies go out to raise you know, 15, 20, 50 million dollars, um, you have to go outside the continent. Because in as much as we can follow on, we can only follow on to an extent and then would like another uh, investor to lead the next round, uh, just, you know, to, so that we're not eating our own pie, like, <laughs> to see, like, is this asset valuable to somebody else? So in our portfolio, the companies who have raised larger rounds have gotten capital from outside, whether it's you know large family offices, um, whether it's uh, you know the likes of say Juven or Creadev, um, those types of uh, institutions are the ones that have uh, that have come in uh, and invested. But it's actually a huge gap, and it's it's troubling for our ecosystem because. We, didn't, we do need, that's, it needs to be filled so that as the companies grow, they know that there's somewhere where they can get capital. Uh, we're seeing some corporates, like Japanese or other corporates that also try to come in to fill. We see also DFIs. Um, IFC and BII have been quite active. It's, I think they're not as, their interventions are in select spaces, so they're not filling the entire gap, but uh, they do play uh, in that space as well. But it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge in the ecosystem. I know there are some funds that are being raised to kind of fill that gap as well. Babaka, she mentioned, she mentioned DFIs. Um, would you consider those more mature rounds and um, who are you bringing along with you? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Th thank you for the question. Um, yes, I, I just want to come back on the point of later stage rounds and the fact that there's a gap in the market. Um, that is true. Uh, we see it as well. And we see our responsibility as DFI and as a major contributor to the startup ecosystem in Africa uh, as also filling the gaps. Um, so we have backed a number of funds, I mean, including TLCOM, who are good partners here, um, from pre-seed funds to Series A and B funds. And one of the key priorities we see uh, for the coming years is to back funds that will be able to lead the rounds from Series B, C, and D. Um, and so that's something that we're looking very closely at and we're really keen to have more players in that space because we don't want the market to be in a situation where the hardest work has been done by all the earliest stage investors here we have in the room and then there's no gross capital for them. And it needs to be gross capital that is tailored to the needs of a fast growing startup. So the pure private equity players investing out of a private equity fund with a private equity mindset might not be the best fit, but you might have specific teams uh, that are completely structured with the VC mindset. And so that, that is what we're, what we're keen to, to do. And just to add another point, because I mean, we've been speaking about down rounds, expectations. Um, I, I don't want this to come across as we don't believe in Africa. 
um, I think it's really important to send also a positive message. So Proparco, we started to invest in startups and VC funds in 2018. Since 2018, we have deployed 120 million euros, and directly and indirectly, we have backed over 150 startups, and we're now doubling down. So our ambition is to deploy 150 million in the next three to four years. So this is not about saying it's, it's the end of the world. It's about saying that we want this ecosystem to be successful, and for it to be successful, it needs to demonstrate commercial returns. And this is important for everyone. It's important for DFIs, it's important for fund managers, it's important for entrepreneurs of today and entrepreneurs of tomorrow. Um, and so we're big believers and we're continuing to invest. Thank you. Um, thankfully, everyone here is a commercial investor. And speaking of commercialization of our assets, one of the questions I had is, how are we supporting strategically now as beyond financing um, these companies as they, they too go through a tough time? Um, so obviously, we are there providing capital, um, but there's still other challenges that they're going through, um, access to human capital for one. Um, Access to markets is another. And so what are some of the ways that you have been building your portfolios um, for growth? Sure, and I, I think that portfolio support is critical, especially with how early the ecosystem in, is in Africa. If you're starting a B2B SaaS company in San Francisco, there's a lot of resources that are available to you, human you know, talent and otherwise, whereas in any nascent ecosystem, it's just a little bit less. And so really what we try to do is with our seat, you know, kind of in between um, developed markets in Africa, bring to bear best that we have um, from developed markets and pair that with our founders and whether that's finding a very particular advisor who has uh, was a founder of a business model that was very similar in a different part of the world that's reached a higher level of scale, tech advisors, other types of uh, you know, very specific strategic advisors that are filling in a hole, um, helping with fundraising process. I think that you know, one thing that we see is that, you know, to your question about what do you take away from fundraising, you know, what I take away from mine is you need to have a really good plan. And it's all about the return on your time. And I see a lot of people having conversations that have a very low probability of success. And you really need to think through who are the investors that are likely to back me? How do I... Uh, ensure that those conversations have the highest probability of success in terms of doing my research on those investors and mapping out you know, what they're gonna be asking and how do I answer some of those questions before I go into the conversation. And so giving that strategic support on, fundraise, on fundraising is another, um, hiring processes, like we've got a lot of frameworks and templates for how to run a good hiring process of different kinds, people that we can bring in to be you know, technical interviewers because if you're a, uh, let's say you're a, a CEO with a financial background and you're trying to hire a CTO, you're not gonna be able to assess whether a CTO candidate is truly world-class or just pretty good because you don't have that background. So I think it's really critical for founders to ask their investors to bring in those kind of resources and to be very aware of what they know and what they don't know. And in places where they don't know, ask their investors or really anyone else in their network to bring that in because the, you know, the bar to succeed in this game is really, really high, and there's so many different things you need to do in a world-class way, and no one person is ever going to have that themselves. So having that support is really critical. And Mike, to you, um, how, has, how much has you being on the ground on the continent contributed to your supporting post-investment um, of your portfolios, and do you think it makes that much of a difference to have that local presence? Yeah. So being on the ground, I think for most of the entrepreneurs as well, you have higher proximity to the problems, to the friction, to the opportunity, to the talent. Um, so in the same way that an entrepreneur is more li likely to succeed, the more they understand the problem, I think as an investor, you're more able to support your portfolio companies if you're in the market. So there's one of our founders here, you know, sitting in their offices after board meeting until kind of 10 p.m., you know, so you don't, you know, shut off the Zoom call but you're sitting there and you keep on grinding on the issues and the problems. Um, but one of the things we do, and I think kind of Peter's uh, outlined it well, like what is quality kind of portfolio support? Uh, one of the things that we do as well is we have a CTO on our team. Uh, because we're a technology-focused investor, 
that enables us pre-investment, but also post-investment to help um, if it's with roadmap, if it's with product, um, if it's with hiring. Um, and you know, one of the co-founders of, of Enza, so John, uh, my general partner, you know, he, he's a software engineer. So it's one of the things we lean into, three decades, software engineer, raised money from Sequoia, sold his business to Microsoft. And that's something that we think, so he has a lot of kind of insight that we can bring. We have a CTO based in South Africa. And we really bring that kind of tech insight into our, into our teams and into our founders. And we have a CTO community as well. Because like being a founder, being, being an investor, we're all learning. We're all building. We're all learning. And some of us will just have insights in certain areas that we can share with others. So we think there's a lot of opportunity in kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. Just yesterday, for example, we brought about 15 of the CEOs of our portfolio companies together in person. Um, and, and we have something called the Founder Partner Program, where we take a slice of our carry, and each founder that we invest in has access to carry. So access to the success in the same way that we do as fund managers of all of uh, each other's companies. And that leads to more collaboration. That leads to more shared insights. Um, and it also leads to us building what we believe over time will be you know, a platform, a group um, that, that is incredibly high value and, and that is helping. So being on the ground is, yeah, it's, it's useful. Well, the LP on the panel, that's where the career is going. They're sharing it with the entrepreneur. You can add it in your development <laughs> impact. Um, getting into exits, and Andretta, you mentioned it about around bringing some strategics like creative uh, onto the table. We haven't seen much IPO activity, and I don't know if we'll see any more in the media, short to medium term. Um, but you have exited uh, maybe a slice of some of your assets. What is the exit environment looking like? And should we be getting into investing with exit in mind, or should we be getting there maybe to chill and grow? Um, and then hopefully, at some point, the entrepreneur can buy us out. So I think um, the nature of the capital that we, we, we are managing requires us to exit. But even then, right, it's a 10-year fund, and you, you know, in some circumstances, you can extend it by another two years. So it, the capital is very patient. Like, if in 10 years you're not able to build a business that we all can profitably exit, then it didn't work. It's not the problem that the, there's something wrong with the model. You know, the, whatever we we're building didn't, uh, didn't work. So I think the fact that you can return capital back to investors is a very good signal um, that it's working. Otherwise, you'll never know that what you're, what you're doing is working. And also, you can't attract global capital, right? Because if people are just pumping in their money and they're not able to get it out, they will not come back. Um, so if we want to build you know, a vibrant VC ecosystem on the continent, we need to be able to show exits and profitable exits at that. And um, so what I'll say, like in terms of kind of the continent, there's one point which is that where it's early, right? Uh, if you can think about what is the age of the Africa tech ecosystem. In 2016, the whole of Africa raised about $275 million, $275 million. So it's pretty early if, if you think about kind of where we are in the ecosystem. Um, so maybe you can say it's like, what, five, six years when things really started taking shape. So that's one piece. So that's why that's one of the reasons why you're not seeing as many exits just as yet. Because uh, my colleague says that you know if you have a pregnant woman, she's gonna give birth in nine months. You can't you know give her anything else so that she gives birth in six in six months, right? The baby will not be fully developed. We have to wait the nine months for the baby to be able to come out. So that's one point. And then the other point is. At, at some point, we need to start showing the exit. So in the next, you know, three to five, six years, we do need to start to, to show those exits on the continent uh, to show that this, uh, things are actually working. There are a couple of exits that have happened a lot within the fintech space, which if you actually do the math and look at when those companies started, they're some of the companies that started uh, much, uh, much, much earlier. So I think over time, we will see exits. Um, it, it, it will... Hopefully it will be sooner uh, rather, than, rather than later. And I think for me, my view is, if you're building a valuable company, you're gonna exit. Um, the problem is not that there are no exits. Maybe the problem is that there are no valuable companies. So yes, our focus right now should be building those companies so that the exits will come. 
And Peter, what's your take on that? Because you earlier had an interesting viewpoint. I mean, if you build it, they will come. Like the the, the focus needs to Who's be built. They? You know, there's a range of different types of exits that I think will be available. I think the focus needs to be building a valuable business. That's got to be far and away the number one focus. And, you know, in terms of exits, I would say I would not expect any exits in the next year or so. It's just, it's just not going to happen for the most part, unless it's M&A. Um, uh, and probably M&A at a little bit more distressed prices. But, you know, at the end of the day, like we have had companies from Africa IPO. We have had companies from Africa be acquired for very large amounts of money. And, you know, it really, the exit market depends on like, what is the appetite to purchase businesses? What is the availability of those businesses? And right now the appetite, um, the IPO market is largely closed. Um, there aren't, you know, many companies that are that acquisitive right now. And so that's just part of the cycle. And that's going to be a regular up and down wave that occurs um, that's going at the same time. You're having a secular rise in the ecosystem. And so let's focus on the secular rise. Let's focus on building very valuable businesses. And I think that this is an excellent environment to build a valuable business because the fundraising environment is instilling a level of discipline that we haven't seen in a long time. And if I look across our portfolio and I see just the <laughs> the incredible amount of work that is going into creating discipline, moving to profitability, like I'm incredibly impressed. And you know, I would even say that you know, from some perspectives, the you know the the improvements that are being made are higher on the companies that have less funding because they need to. And necessity is the mother of all invention. And so, you know, I think that there are gonna be a lot of businesses, valuable businesses built now, that should be the focus. And in a couple of years, when the macro environment has changed, let's start talking about exits again. Interesting, I'll just give you for a short time. Um, I wonder if we're not talking about exits where we imagine IPO type. Is there room for smaller exits in the lower rounds. I think there's going to be a ton of consolidation. There should be, you know, uh, at the end of the day, funding is not available to everyone. And the companies that do have access to capital that have built big war chests and are safe boats in a, in a difficult, in a difficult ocean right now should be looking to acquire. And I think that companies should be very open to joining forces to go after some of these big problems together. And, you know, it's, it's always difficult when, you know, you are a founder that started your thing, it's your baby combining with another business. But, you know, I think the ecosystem will be stronger if there is some consolidation as, um, you know, people join forces to go after really big problems. Right. And for you, Babaka, because you're writing uh, checks in the B, C and maybe D round, um, are you supporting the consolidation initiative um, so that if they arrange it for it uh, at their portfolio levels, then you're happy to take on that bigger asset? So as, as, as an investor, um, of course, we're totally open to having our portfolio companies acquire uh, smaller targets. I think what is really important when we're speaking about mergers and acquisitions is not the solution to everything. Um, and it's something that is extremely complex. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as an institution, we also back much larger corporates and financial institutions that are existing industry leaders, so to say. And M&A requires a lot of work in terms of integration from cultural, uh, technological, and operations perspective. And so it's something that should not be taken lightly. So I think it's something that can make sense for companies, as you say, at the later stage, maybe Series C, Series B, uh, but it needs to have a very strong strategic component to it. Is it to enter a new market? Is it to integrate a new skill uh, or a new product uh, that they don't have? And so our role as investors is to leverage the experience we have in this space to help the founders think through what are the key criteria and in, under what conditions and at what price would we do this acquisition? But yes, we, I mean, we have those discussions, yeah. Is anyone doing an M&A right now? Sorry? Is anyone of you doing a, a consolidation? <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, well, maybe not like this minute, but we do have, uh, we're co-invested with, uh, actually, <laughs> with Peter and with Mike in a company that has grown quite inorganically. Um, so they have acquired a number of businesses um, in East Africa, West Africa, uh, in Francophone Africa, and now in North Africa. Uh, as an entry into those into those markets, and I think with acquisitions, the important thing is to understand what are you acquiring, um, and then how is that going to be valuable to your business? Because to Babaga's point, it's pretty complex because there's an integration piece. You know, after you've written the check and signed the documents, now you need to integrate that team, the tech, and everything that goes with it. Um, so it's not something that you take fairly lightly, but we do have companies that have uh, that have looked at seen other assets that they can buy. I think also the thing is not to necessarily just acquire because an asset is distressed, uh, like really understand the value because actually that can cause you more trouble. So, and just to jump in, uh, most acquisitions fail. Most M and A actually fails, and as Babakar is saying, it might sound like a nice solution. And if you have two teams, you know. Venture investors were typically backing businesses that are burning cash and are growing. And as Peter said, those ones that actually don't need the capital are going to attract a lot. However, often in M&A, you're trying to either grow into a new market or you're trying to solve perhaps a growth issue. Or maybe there's a strategic kind of value of combining two different businesses, maybe in a similar vertical or expanding into new geographies. Um, but you have your burn can double, right, if you have two businesses. So it often doesn't kind of solve that, that problem kind of around cash. The integration is very challenging. We currently have a portfolio company who is going through uh, some M&A of a very interesting business. And it's more of a geographic expansion play. There's going to be M&A that takes place over the next 12, 18, 24 months, but it is going to be distressed, mostly. It's mostly going to be distressed. And why it's going to be distressed is because people who have raised capital in the past 12, 18, 24 months at too high a price are struggling to raise capital now at that price or higher. Mike. Because people are unwilling to pay that price or higher, they're distressed in the market and they need to kind of sell for, for very cheap. So that's yes. what we're I was uh, just going to ask to you, who's leading that conversation? Is it the founder or is it the investor where the distressed, the, the investor in the distressed asset maybe is sh shopping it to their partners, you to Peter, or is it the founder who genuinely concedes so, that I need help. Yeah, so I think, I mean, as you know, the, the well-known saying goes, businesses are bought, not sold. So I think kind of going out to the market and going through kind of a sales process in a distressed situation is probably going to be quite distressing. Um, it, typically what we've seen, and, and we have had acquisition already kind of within our portfolios, we did sell one of, of the companies that was actually in a distressed situation to another. And it's, you put the founders together, typically, if the founders can communicate, can understand, have a shared vision, you know, it, there's a huge ego question, you know, when you're building something. And it, it doesn't have to be a bad thing because perhaps without the ego, so many of the businesses that are being built wouldn't be built, right? If it's, if it's an ambition, if it's a chip on the shoulder, if it's just a need or a desire uh, to, to, to leave a legacy. Um, one thing we'd love to see more of is exceptional founders who have core competency in a local market like rather than trying to scale across Africa, which is maybe a little bit of a fallacy, right? It's incredibly difficult from a re regulation kind of culture, technology perspective to move across, across markets, but to actually combine, to collaborate and say, let me run this market. Um, and there's so many similar managers, similar teams where we're perhaps wasting resource by duplicating efforts uh, where, where everyone's trying to build a pan-African business, but starting in their market and then going surface level um, in a parallel market. Oh, Babaka, so, jump in. Someone can press snooze. If, if, <laughs> if I just wanted to echo um, what Mike was just saying. And I think it comes back to, to Peter's point earlier, build it and they will come. Even for smaller businesses, even for businesses that have not been as successful in raising, if you have managed to build something that has value, and I'll just give two or three examples. One thing that has value is regulated sector having a license and operating in a market that other players could be interested in, in entering. That has value, that can be acquired. Having a customer portfolio in a specific segment, that can be acquired. That is actually much easier to acquire than acquiring the whole business. You buy the business, you keep the customers. 
And the third thing is having a product and dominating a specific niche. Because if you have a niche, you have something that you're really selling, so that vertical product can actually be taken and integrated into a business rather than integrating the whole organization. And so it comes back to the point uh, of Andre Atal, but you have to know what you're acquiring and why. But from the perspective of the seller, you have to also build something that is valuable. Great. Um, I don't know if I have time for a Q&A. Um, yeah, time is up. I think we'll give another like, uh, you guys, how, do you guys have the bandwidth to answer questions? Because <laughs> sugar levels are really low. Anyone with a question? Anyone with a question? We can have, we can have a compromise. Oh, there you go. Um, all right. Yeah, there's a microphone coming towards you. Uh, any other question? Or we take that one and then we break for lunch? All right, good. Please introduce yourself and direct your question to one of the panelists. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Katsuchi Ofreata. I work at a family office based in Accra. Um, on the point of m and I was curious, you spoke, um, or the panel spoke, primarily around m and activity between fintechs. Have you guys seen any activity with perhaps traditional financial institutions seeing opportunities with distressed fintechs and taking that opportunity to acquire and, and then expand into that space? Thank you. I think the, the irony is that I, I don't know the exact numbers, so I won't give, give uh, the, the precise figures, but the value of all the fintechs that we have on paper relative to the publicly listed financial institutions in Africa is multiple uh, times higher. And where in a more kind of uh, a developed market, we would see those existing financial institutions, the visas, for example, acquiring the pay stacks, um, which has been the exception, not the norm. What we're seeing is almost every fintech is going to buy a bank. Everyone is trying to buy an MFI. Everyone wants to kind of be a bank to, to, to become these challengers. Um, so there are certain financial institutions that are integrating and, and you know, investing smaller checks into some of these companies, specifically in Nigeria. We're starting to see a little bit of that in Kenya. Um, but, but we're not seeing, often also due to the value expectations from traditional banks, where you have like a balance sheet multiple uh, to the tech companies that have these huge, maybe GMV multiples, there's, there's a misalignment of, of expectations and, and uh, view of value. Yeah, I think the few times I've seen it, they're more buying a product than the company. Um, and there's that value misalignment as well that comes. And just, just to complete quickly, I think uh, what was mentioned by Mike is, is important. This disconnect is something that we see. So we also invest in banks and financial institutions. And it's very interesting because you would see a bank that does $100 million in net income and $50 million in dividends. And they would be valued at $1 billion or $1.5 billion, which is about the valuation of a startup that has $100 million in revenues. And so coming back to the point of building a sustainable ecosystem, we also have to make sure that the businesses and the valuations we're building and the operating models that we're building and the profitability makes sense at scale and at exit, because otherwise there will be a lot of loss in the market. And I guess that's why DFIs exist, because you see all of this and you should now start <laughs> questioning your portfolios across the different chains. We try to. <laughs> well, I don't have any parting shots. I don't know if anyone has a parting shot. Just yes, please. Everyone gets 30 seconds of parting shots before we go for lunch. Parting shot. Uh, again, because it's such a full room, I feel so special to, to communicate my, my parting shot to you all. Um, my, my ask, and it's for you, and to kind of communicate to entrepreneurs who are building, is like, we need to reset our expectations on valuations to be more realistic so that we can actually build businesses over the decades that are creating value. And I know it's a very difficult ask and I'm only feeling comfortable now because there are about 15 people here. Um, we are feeling machines that think and not thinking machines that feel. So it is very uncomfortable to reset these expectations. When you quit a job, 
when you jump into something, when you put your own capital into something to say, I expect, I want it to be X, Y, Z, but we have to be patient. Uh, it's going to take time um, and understand that when an investor is pushing for a certain price, it's not because we want to take a business, it's because we believe that a fair and a sensible price makes most sense kind of long-term to kind of build a business. So that's my parting shot. I'll take the opportunity to echo basically exactly that so it sinks in. Like, let go of expectations that you had in 2020 and 21. Um, the quicker you let go of that old paradigm and focus on the new paradigm, which is based on building a big business, or sorry, building a good business, not necessarily a big business as, as quickly as you thought, um, potentially doing a down round, resetting your expectations on valuation, and also resetting your expectations for how difficult this might be and how long you might need to be on this journey. That's really critical. And then once you let go of that, you can really focus on the things that are most important. And you know, the, the other thing I would add is take care of yourself. This is not easy. I mean, it's not easy for us as invest investors, you know, and you know, I think all of us here started our started our own funds, so we're startups as well. And I understand the incredible amount of stress that we're all under in this environment. And I think it's really critical to recognize that recognize again that you know we are humans feeling humans and um, having the right degree of self-care and the right acknowledgement that this is a, a marathon not a sprint is really important because um, you know if we run ourselves into the ground our businesses are surely going to fail as well and our businesses are in some ways only going to be as healthy as we are so just remember that great thank you um, I said I didn't have any but now I do uh, <laughs> Again, going back to my Eminem quote, uh, we need to snap back to reality because there goes gravity. Um, but I uh, also want to urge us to maybe not shoot for the unicorn and look at the camel for sustainable businesses. A camel lives, thrives off resilience and we have a chance to build camels. Uh, I think what I'll say is, um, I think I don't think we should also just walk away thinking that it's about valuations. I think one of the things that had been thrown away in 2021 was around governance and just making sure that the operational infrastructure within the business was intact because people were chasing, chasing valuations. So I think just governance is also an important piece of building sustainable businesses on the continent. I think especially for us on this, on this uh, panel, like we will live and die in Africa, right? Like the money we're raising is to fund African uh, startups. So we have vested interest to make sure that we're building a sustainable ecosystem. And I think also for entrepreneurs is that there is capital. Uh, we are spending day and nights fundraising so that we can invest uh, into, into African entrepreneurs. So I think all is not lost. There is lots of capital and many funds are coming online to be able to support entrepreneurs. And so on my side, I want to echo everything that has been said. Uh, I think they, they said everything, so it makes it really hard for me to say anything meaningful at this point. But I will, I will just add that uh, we've spoken a lot about money. Uh, of course, money is a big part of the equation. Um, we've spoken about building good businesses. I think that's also important. I think the connection between the two is really picking the right shareholders. We speak a lot about investors and capital, but I think founders need to be very, very, um, how to say, cautious and approach this in a very strategic manner. Who do you want to be your long-term shareholders and partners in building your business? How do they see the future of the company, of the sector? Is it aligned with what you want to build? And do you believe you can have a good partnership and what value are they adding to your business? Because especially in this critical time where maybe there will be a little less capital, um, it's important to have the best group of people around you to support you and to build a business. And as Peter said, it's hard and you don't want to be alone in that. All right, another round of applause kindly for one last time for our panelists. We truly appreciate your contributions. We really, really uh, enjoyed the, the, the discussions here, Eva and all of you on the panel. Please, a photo session now, and then I will release you for lunch.
ladies and gentlemen thank you so much it's been nice moderating the sessions with uh for you guys my name is brian george Tiano from ntv you can catch me on twitter at brian george ke that's the end of my involvement with uh you today as far as emceeing and moderation is concerned thank you so so much it's been a pleasure enjoy the rest of the event and please be kind and be good to everyone <laughs>